Okay, so do we have everybody in or we're all good? So we just roll for a few minutes. So everyone, welcome this afternoon. I'm just going to allow a couple of seconds for everybody to uh, come in because I, I don't want you to, to miss, miss any of this. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted this afternoon that we have um, Dr. Carl uh, Thomas with us. And we have a very interesting uh, topic this afternoon. And basically, it, I'm going to say that it culminates, he may culminate earlier, but we're looking at um, what enables you to demand the value you deserve. So with that, um, I'm going to kick off. So Carl, the stage is yours. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks very much. No problem at all. Uh, so folks, you're all extremely welcome. My name is Carl Thomas. Uh, I'm going to share my slides in a second. Uh, one of the things I will say is, as we go through this, have you got access to mics? You guys can all speak to me, yeah? I can release them all. That's, that's yeah, yeah. We release, can release so it's absolutely dreadful. I'm going to retract that. I'll unmute everybody. Uh, it's probably <laughs> a little bit softer. They're in prison. Okay. Yeah. No. So I... right the way through this, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Feel free to jump in. I'm extremely interested in hearing your thoughts on some of the comments as well. I'm going to share my slides. Um, here we go and go from the beginning. Where here we go. Okay, that's me. That's me doing the things I do. Um, cool. Okay, that's me. So uh, a big part of what I do is creative and cultural entrepreneurship. Uh, for Trinity College, it's one of the courses that I run there. I run quite a few courses. I'm also a consultant in broader innovation and entrepreneurship for lots of different startups and lots of different spaces. I do have an art and design background myself, um, and I'll be probably talking to you a little bit about that and a little bit around the experiences that I have in relation to that. But today we're talking about initially cracking that creative myth um, and some of the behaviors and some of the sort of reinforced and self-perpetuating myths that kind of creep in there that really get in the way of our ability to make money as creatives. Um, and I can guarantee you any of the points of resistance you've experienced around this, any of the discomfort in your stomach about having to think about it, I have been there. I've very definitely been that person in the past and I've had to unlearn a lot of behaviors allow myself to learn new behaviors that did genuinely serve me. So we'll be talking about some of that. Um, you're probably not going to agree with everything I say, and I'm perfectly okay with that. That's generally across the course that we have in Trinity. We maybe have between 60 and 70 students on the course uh, for each, each iteration of it. And we don't always get full agreement on these kinds of conversations. And that's great. Um, so do jump in and question some of the points that I have, because you might be the person who asked the question that somebody else is afraid to ask. My first question to you though is, why are you here? And I can't see the participants names. There we go. Um, so I want you to think about this for a second. Why are you here? Because this will speak to your motivation, but it will also speak to your commitment that if you do decide you want to make a change, that there is scope to change. So, I'm going to give you a second to think about that, and then I will pick out some victims to answer that question for me. Just one or two sentences will do. I will go to Monica. Can we get Monica to tell me why? You're... Oh, we're going with chat. Is Monica's yeah, mic Carl, released? Yeah. I've, I, I've tried to unmute everybody and I've asked everybody to unmute themselves. And uh, it's, a slightly, it's a slightly different um, mode to what we normally use. So I don't want everybody to be um, totally uh, taken aback or whatever by it. So maybe people could tell us if, if they are not muted or if they are muted. Um, and there's somebody's telling me there's no option to mute or unmute, sorry. Okay. Um, can you type in text? Can you guys add into the they, chat? They, they, can, they can add to the chat. Okay, well, uh, we'll go with that. Yeah. yeah, so folks, if you want to add into the chat, why are you here? You get everybody to do that straight off. And then I will read and interpret your answers and give them all kinds of interesting voices.
So I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet. Do they have a chat option? They do. Sometimes it takes a bit of time. No problem. Yeah. yeah there we go. Same as Alpha is encouraging. No problem. Okay. Deirdre, I love the language. And this is one of the things that we're going to talk about as well, because one of the things I work with lots of creatives in lots of different spaces, and we're great at recruiting language that might mean something to us, but it's sort of lots of really interesting umbrella terms that doesn't have the kind of clarity that other people might need. So when you say we're sustaining ourselves whilst encouraging others to be sustainable, I get what you mean, but we've got to be careful. I can draw or paint till the cows come home, but I have no idea how to make a business out of this. That's part-time. So have other commitments. Okay, not an uncommon uh, challenge, Stephen. So that's two people. We have 13 people on as participants. That's okay if you're ruminating a little bit on this. How many people are here because they want to start making money? Can I answer all of them, I hope? All of them, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. I would ask who sculpted this, believe in yourself and don't stand on ceremony. That's a great statement, Dan. I'm not sure if it's related to the first question as to why you're here or if it's related to the Pieta. Um, okay, this for me, one of the challenges that we see with people uh, about the space in terms of being creatives, in terms of being artists, designers, craft makers, um, I have a good product which receives good feedback, but it's definitely getting them noticed. Yeah, Karen, that's not unusual either uh, in this space. And again, it's maybe because you've studied to be an artist, designer, or craft maker, and not a social media expert. And that's, I think, a pretty reasonable um, reason why maybe you can't get the kind of attention that you do might need. When we talk about um, business and the entrepreneurial practice uh, in arts and creativity, Throughout history, we've developed these kind of myths that artists are a certain way and creatives are a certain way. Um, and one of the big challenges for people is the sort of the capacity to stand up and say, this is me, this is my product, this is the value it produces, and this is, you know, this is essentially what I do. Historically, that wasn't the case. Historically, artists were comfortable with representing and presenting themselves out there. And one of the one of my favorite stories about this historically is that. In the late 1400s, Michelangelo carved his name across the sash on the Pieta. And one of the stories that was created around that was that he heard a misattribution in the Sistine Chapel, that it was attributed to Gabo of Milan. So Michelangelo stole back in in the middle of the night and carved his name into it. Michelangelo was also one of the first artists who disagreed with the biography that was produced by him or about him, and then um, basically commissioned his own biographer to produce the story that really represented Michelangelo as a brand, as a product that ticked the boxes of what made somebody a desirable uh, creative in that period. Um, Michelangelo loved to sort of celebrate the idea and culturally they love to celebrate the idea of immediacy associated with a creative individual. Um, but that's that, that piece whereby he carved his name into the sash is a fabrication. Um, he'd already carved it in, that was part of the design process. Uh, when he was building it. But that story kind of keys into the element of brand because Michelangelo was one of the first real creatives who was conscious of legacy um, and how that was going to impact kind of the wider narrative. Um, who produced this? I'll throw the answer into the chat. Who's the maker? Who's the artist? Warhol. Yeah. There we go. Nice, handy, straightforward enough one. Um, yes, and I'm not going to go down the whole sort of study of authorship route, but Warhol did produce this. But in fact, Warhol bought the idea for this from a woman named Muriel Lotto. And we're going to talk a little bit about Warhol as we go through this first section, because he's actually extremely important in terms of the 20th, 21st search century uh, perception of what art, creativity, craft and business essentially are. One of the elements that are attached is uh, the fact that he bought it from Muriel Lotto. She wasn't just a random person that he knew. She was a gallery owner. She was keyed into what was in fashion at the time. She keyed into what was important and to what people were responding to. 
Um, and that actually speaks quite strongly to, to Warhol's sort of capacity as a networker as much as anything else. Now, when I was writing my PhD, Warhol was one of the creatives that I looked at. And having sort of grown up in creative spaces and having mixed in circles around music and circles around design and circles around art, an awful lot of the behaviors that Warhol exhibited would have sat with me as being unprincipled and would have sat with me as being you know, lacking in values. And they were really, really challenging. And it wasn't until I sort of migrated into a more business space that I recognized that they were business behaviors that he was exhibiting um, and not what we would consider these sort of traditional creative behaviors. He was a strategic networker. Um, he knew that he wanted to achieve something. So he acted in a way that allowed him to achieve these different sort of um, goals that he'd set for himself. He was extremely goal oriented. He wanted his work in galleries, so he made friends with gallery owners. He strategically sought out opportunities to have his commercial work in certain magazines. Part of what he did was he would go and make friends with the secretaries in those offices, recognizing the network map that he needed to manage to be able to get into to be able to get his work into certain magazines. Then that presence in those magazines created opportunities for him to get his work into different types of galleries. So he was strategic in this. And we might think of being strategic in this as being maybe disingenuous. I used to. But actually, if we've set ourselves a goal, and this is the path to the goal, we can be strategic without being unprincipled. Um, because he didn't undersell himself as a person. He just recognized that he'd set himself a goal. And this is how you get to achieve that goal. And we see this in business so often. We see this with people who create products that they know that there are certain people who potentially have an opportunity to fund these products. So they reach out to them. They connect with them on LinkedIn. They connect with them on Instagram. They connect them on Facebook, whatever the avenue is. So that that voice has access to the name, you know, whether it's Andy Warhol, whether it's somebody in a, in a business space, but it is about having the capacity to be strategic and planning to recognize who is important in your field. So that if you are creating a product, and you're struggling to get visibility, who can help you get visibility for that product? That to me seems now like a pretty obvious journey, but it certainly wouldn't have been a few years ago. Now, the other side of this is there's also some of those personal challenges that you might have, some of those resistances around that kind of behavior. And again, because most of us would have studied art, design, different craft skills as well, people don't talk to you about business in those spaces. It's if you want to learn about business, you go and study business. There's a reason why business people aren't always particularly good at craft. It's not because they don't have an aptitude for it. It's because they haven't studied it. Uh, so we have to recognize that there are certain skills that we're not going to have when we graduate. I used to lecture in fine art, design, uh, visual merchandising, visual communications. And students would come to me at the end of the three years and say, now what? You know, we've learned all of these incredible skills, but we've no idea how to put together the kind of CV or portfolio that gets us the kind of jobs that we want or the opportunities that we want. So there's, there's an awful lot more that we can learn. And just because we're growing and learning new skills doesn't mean we're changing who we are necessarily. It just means we're learning and adapting. Um, when we think about this sort of Warhol example, the reason we see it the way, we, the way it is now is also because of Warhol's capacity for adaptability. So he had a product, but it's a guy named Blum who positioned it pretty much as we see it now as a series of shelves. It was other people who gave it meaning as well. So there's this constant sort of uh, evolution in terms of what the work is and where it fits. If we're so rigidly invested in our work and we see our work as being this sort of externalization of who we are, as we're kind of trained to think of our work a lot of time, and culturally certainly that's a reinforced mindset, then it can be very, very difficult for us to evolve, grow. And one of the big challenges then is how do I put a price on this? Because it's something that's grown from me, grown from my experience. Um, and it's very, very difficult to put a price on those kinds of uh, those kinds of products. Warhol would have said that the um, good art is the best business or being being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. Making money is art and working is art. Um, and again, this would have really it would have been a mindset I would have really struggled with until I saw in the business space those behaviors um, and it shifted my perception of them because they were a set of beliefs that I'd inherited. Um, that I became quite entrenched in. And I certainly see this with a lot of the students that I work with who are extremely entrenched in, in beliefs that don't serve them. 
Um, and this is where that growth mindset comes into play, being able to challenge, test intellectual humility, intellectual autonomy, being able to challenge your beliefs to recognize whether they're valid, whether they serve you. Um, because an awful lot of the beliefs that we've inherited, certainly in this space, are outdated. They existed, they've existed for a long time um, and they no longer serve us. Shift to my next slide. I'd love for you to read this. And then maybe I'm conscious you can't speak to me. So I'd love for you to have a read of this and then pop your thoughts into the chat. Anything that comes to mind on this? Do we agree? Do we disagree? Are there any comments or statements in there that you find interesting? I might even ask you if there's nothing at all to just type no into the chat. So I know I'm not speaking to the, there you go. Your USP is what people love about craft, heart and power to trill. Okay. And for those of you who don't know, your USP is your unique selling point. Ashling agrees. Okay. Uh, my opinion, artists are regarded as hobbyists unless they approach their practice from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to think about that quote. It's, Difficult to take the pressure off when Instagram only shows people's best work. Yeah. Anything else? So I'm conscious Ashling agrees. So she's probably going to find what I say next a little bit jarring, but I think this is absolute balderdash. Um, and that's me selecting the, the most appropriate words for the moment, but I have strong feelings on this one. So when we say artists are not like athletes. Well, that's a false equivalency at the outset. Of course, they're not like athletes. Um, so then the next statement, uh, you know, we cannot win gold. Well, we absolutely can win gold because there are a huge number of competitions in the craft and design space uh, whereby we do compete and we can win gold. And that does contribute then to your CV and your capacity then to create more conversations and to position yourself differently and to leverage that earlier success on your ongoing journey. Um, so we absolutely can win gold. The next slide will show you that. Uh, we cannot beat other creatives. We absolutely can beat other creatives because you are constantly competing for visibility, for um, space in people's minds and in people's heads. You're competing for sales, okay? And if you're here to think about making money and then you don't think you can compete, well, then you are a massive point of divergence because there is limited resources in terms of people's money, in terms of people's time, in terms of people's headspace. So you are absolutely competing in that space. Um, so you're competing for something in there. Uh, creating to be the best is a waste of energy. That's a pretty subjective statement. I would say that's maybe the writer statement. It's also a nice protective shield. It's also a nice way to say, you know, I'm gonna stay back from competing in this space. Okay. You know, there's lots of people who produce products that aren't necessarily the best product, but they still want to sell them. You know, so there's, there's that to consider. Create to connect to the people who need you. That's wonderful, but you know, knitting hats for your granny isn't going to keep food in your belly. Um, and it's not going to keep your roof over your head um, because they're out there. They absolutely are. And if we're talking about connecting to the people who need you, then we're talking potentially about a job to be done piece in here. Uh, whereby we're producing a product or a service. And I, art absolutely fits into that space, even though we, you know, in a museological context, we might think of it as being something slightly different. But we know art is a product or a service and it has a job to be done. It serves, it serves a need. And certainly that's the, the case in the design and craft space. Um, because there is no right way 
okay, but in a cultural context and in terms of the capacity to make sales, there's a right way um, and take the pressure off. Well, and focus on your unique brand of magic. So this pressure piece, if you want to make sales, if you want to be entrepreneurial alongside your craft or your creativity, then there's going to be an element of pressure. Um, that's the, the company I spend a great deal of time creating need uh, in my client pools. Mind. Absolutely, Dan, that's exactly part of what we have to do in here. Um, helping them to understand the value in terms of what you offer. Um, I'm wondering how does Ashling feel about what I've said there? Because I'm conscious she was a hard agreement. There is one of the design awards. That's the golden line from the Venice Biennale. Sign Crafts and Council, awards and supports. Um, and there are countless other awards and supports out there for artists, craft makers, designers uh, as well. So while it's a nice statement and it serves as sometimes a badge of honor to appear quite principled and think, well, I'm going to create the best for who I am. Um, there is an objective element in here, and that objectivity is sort of whether somebody will or won't buy the product or service you're producing. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind in that context. Who produced this? Waiting for an answer to arrive in the, in the text, in the chat box. There we go. Yeah, Van Gogh. Um, we are massively burdened by, and Stephen's probably, maybe it won't matter to Stephen. We are massively burdened by the narrative that was being, that has been constructed around Van Gogh. Massively burdened by it in the creative space because not him himself, but the narrative that's been constructed around it aligns with the, the sort of the rise in psychoanalysis, the expectation that creatives should be struggling individuals, should be melancholy, should be emotionally damaged and challenged, uh, and should be comfortable with poverty because that is part of the kudos that's attached to the work you produce, um, has massively burdened the culture of creativity uh, since the late 1800s, certainly into the early part of the 20th century, where that poverty piece was reinforced. And you look at when, when America took over as the center of the cultural world, um, and then they had, their, had uh, the sort of the dissemination of their, their work globally by, you know, funded as well by the CIA. But, um, and that's not just me being a um, conspiracy theorist, that's actually the case. Uh, but this impoverished, emotionally, um, damaged artist sort of trope is a real challenge for us because it sort of feeds back into some of what we saw in this statement. You know, take the pressure off. Absolutely. You know, let's not burn out, but we can, we're humans. We can handle a bit of pressure. We can handle some stress. Um, the fact that we have statements around, you know, making that connection piece, that should be enough for you. There's, there's more to what you guys do than just the case in here. Um, anybody get a sense of who created these? Which artists produced these? It is Stephen. Your name is coming up. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Stephanie. That's my eyes. That's an age thing. Um, I saw the S-T-E-P-H. Apologies. Anybody got a sense of who produced these? Okay. Good guess, Dan. I would have definitely said there's a Henry Moore vibe off the middle one, all right. All three are produced by Francis Bacon. Um, and what this, and again, this sort of speaks to one of the challenges we have as creatives is that Bacon would have destroyed and sort of gotten rid of and hidden an awful lot of his early works in much the way Michelangelo destroyed a lot of his preparatory drawings. Um, because there is this sense that creativity should be immediate. Um, and this sort of feeds into another one of those myths in terms of who we are, what we produce and how we produce. And there, there's a real challenge around these because there's so many of these myths buttressing this sort of skewed persona of what creatives are, that universities perpetuate these myths, we perpetuate these myths. And then we have these sort of culturally supported expectations that are perpetuating these myths. And as somebody mentioned in the chat there, you've got Instagram presenting only perfection, sort of final product rather than the journey. And the reality is 
you guys are producing products that take time to produce in much the same way somebody who develops a new app has to take time to produce the new app. Um, and this feeds into then the kind of the payment system and structure. We have to be paid appropriately for the value that we produce. Um, anybody got a name for this piece in the middle? Give it a second. This is also Warhol. This is the work Warhol produced before he moved on producing Campbell's soup cans. Um, and he revisited this, but he recognized that he had a goal and he wanted to achieve in that space. So he allowed himself to evolve. And when I say evolve, I mean evolve as a business person and uh, not necessarily an artist because that piece is you know, up to yourself, whether you consider pop art more, uh, more appropriate than, than commercial art, but this is more, much more similar to his commercial work. But he allowed himself to pivot because he knew he wanted to get his work into different galleries, the Baudelaire Gallery and uh, a few others in his space. And he knew that the kind of work that was acceptable in those spaces was different to what he would have naturally been producing. So he allowed himself to move and pivot to achieve his goal. One of the things I'm going to ask you to do, this is again, just sort of referring back to Warhol because he was so good at the business and entrepreneurial side of things. He networked phenomenally well. This is Henry Gelzelder. Gelzelder was the head of modern contemporary art. I think it was in the Met uh, during the period that Warhol was working. And he gave Warhol some ideas. What I would love for you to think about now is who are five people you could connect with to help give, let's say, greater visibility to your work? So who are five people you could connect with this week that could give create greater visibility to your work? I will ask Stephanie to answer that. Now that I can see the name. I'm also using a tiny laptop today. So it's like a, a 10 inch screen. So it's even smaller. Um, Stephanie, who do you think would be five people that you could connect with this week that would help give greater visibility to your work? Three tutors for my course. Uh, friends are two artists as well. Okay, absolutely. Um, one of my former students connected with me, asked me to write her a reference for a funding award. And I wrote her a blistering reference and she got her award. So that's useful. When we're thinking about networking though, it's not just the people you know, it's the people they know as well. Um, and this is something entrepreneurs are extremely, extremely good at is leveraging their networks and being proactive in developing their networks. And one of the points I would have made, uh, I have three tutors, yeah. Um, one of the, I'm not sure why the ah is there, now I'm worried. Um, one of the points I would have made to my students in the past is that you kind of have to fish where the fish swim. Um, that might mean going to openings and that might mean going to um, exhibitions, that might mean going to end of year uh, university exhibitions as well. And they're saying, well, we've done that previously. You know, we've done that, we've gone to the exhibition. I say, well, there's a difference in just showing up to showing up with a strategy and with a sense in mind of who you want to meet, what you're going to say to them um, and how you're going to approach them. And it's being proactive in this sense that it's not just about being seen at these events. It's about making the effort to go over and introduce yourself to people. And this might sound redundant to some people because you do that all of the time, but it's not just as well then by extension, introducing yourself to people, but having your elevator pitch to a degree prepared this sort of 30 second to one minute statement on what it is about this person that is of value to you. you know, why are you introducing yourself to this person? And it is, again, being prepared and being strategic. I see these, this at innovation and entrepreneurship events all the time where people believe in yourself and don't stand on ceremony. I mean, Dan, these are great, great statements. Um, but what does that look like in reality? You know, what, what does believing in yourself and not standing on ceremony look like uh, in these kind of things? Because one of the things that I would have seen with students over the years is that when you bump into them at exhibitions, they're kind of 
hovering in a corner rather than saying, okay, there's Dan Taylor over there. He knows X gallery owner. I want to get into that gallery. I'm going to go over there and speak to Dan. Same, you know, I see Stephanie over there. Stephanie happens to know three tutors and two artists. And one of those artists happens to be exhibiting in the gallery that I want to be part of. Can I position myself whereby I'm able to make that approach so that I get the ends and the reward that I feel is appropriate? But I would absolutely challenge you on this. So Stephanie mentioned three tutors and two artists. Think of that as the starting point. Who do each of those tutors know? Who do those two artists know? Or we can reverse this and say, this is the goal we want to achieve. Can we network and work backward? Uh, G became a client of mine because I contacted German. Yeah, that's it. I mean, there's, it is about being proactive and a little bit pushy on this, you know, and being able to make those connections. Sometimes it's reaching out to people through Instagram. Sometimes it's about reaching out to people through LinkedIn, but finding them where they are. Um, why should I, or why should anyone buy your product? Can any of you give a definable statement in the chat? I'm conscious we're moving on in time, but can any of you give a definable statement in the chat as to why anybody should buy what it is that you produce? I ask students this on usually the first night of the course, and there's always struggles with it. Why should anyone buy your product? Let me give you a second to think about it. An authentic, traceable, sustainable, kind to clients and trustworthy. Okay. Are those things important to your clients, Deirdre? Okay, the clients you choose. It's an interesting one. It reminds me of Rothko talking about his work and feeling that his work were his babies um, and was reluctant to send them out into the world. The clients you choose. That must be a nice position to be in whereby you get to choose who will buy your work rather than a, a broader uh, demographic. Uh, because it solves their problem, Ella. How does it solve their problem, Ella? Yeah. I'm interested to see what Ella comes back with in terms of it solves their problem. This is always a real challenge for people thinking about um, their work in a problem solving context. Let's give Ella a second. And um, they have a need, which <laughs> that's essentially the exact same answer, just uh, slightly reworded. Okay, you don't want to tell us what your product is. That's fair enough. But what you've actually just done there is a game of semantics. You've said exactly the same thing uh, without giving us the actual answer. This is something you really need to get a handle on. Uh, all of my products are useful items, but they are carefully made with a unique twist with the environment in mind. Okay. Okay, this reminds me of a conversation I had with an arts group recently where we were pairing up clinicians in a health space with artists. And when the artist spoke about the value they created in the space, it was beautiful language. It was interesting. And the clinicians sat there with screensaver mode faces on because they couldn't decipher what the actual meaning was. And it was so evasive. And I would say each of those answers, obviously we're speaking on a screen, are pretty evasive answers. Because when I ask you, why should anybody buy? It's, it's okay to say, you know, they solve a problem for the person. But then when I ask what is the problem that they solve or how do we expand on that? The craft and design product enhances the buyer's ego. Okay, so there's a status element attached to it. Fair enough. Uh, but we need to get really, really clinical on this, on this language, because if we're expecting the buyer or the end user to kind of create the meaning, then they may be misinterpreting your intent 
And if you've got somebody like, who was it? Uh, Deirdre, who's pretty specific on who she chooses to sell to, then there's an avenue whereby you're going to miss opportunity in there. Um, so we're talking a little bit around the, the jobs to be done piece in here. What job does your, do, jo does your work do for your, your buyer or your end user? And I can guarantee you, the more rigorous a hold you have on this statement, the better you'll be able to communicate its value to your end users. Um, and it is something worth working on because it's not a case of if you build it, they will come because we are in that competitive space. Um, and it is worth considering some of this in a, in a more um, sort of targeted context. You know, we talk about the desirability in innovation. We talk about desirability, viability, and feasibility all of the time. In this context, I tend to talk to students about desirability and viability. You know, as a business, do you have a business model that is allowing you to sustain a mindset whereby you choose specific buyers? Um, it sounds like some of you have a handle on the language of unique selling points. Uh, what is the value proposition? You know, when you talk about it solving a problem for your end user, what problem does it solve? And are there any additional gains in that space? Um, or are we just producing a solution rather than something that we can tie into their broad, broader product ecosystem as well? And attaching the kind of the, the feelings, the sort of the um, and aligning with the psychographic elements in there too. In terms of your channels of communication, somebody mentioned struggling with visibility. That sounds to me like there's a gap between a gap in understanding between potentially who the clients are and what the product is. Um, are we using the right kind of channels? Are we leveraging our channels appropriately? Um, who mentioned struggling to get their products in front of the right people? I don't want to go all the way back through the chat. Um, sustaining. You know. And what do they think? The, what do they think is a gap in that space in terms of creating visibility? It's unfortunate we don't have the chat. Um, active. Okay, well, ah, I don't know how to use the media effectively. Okay, how could you learn that, Karen? This is one of these pieces whereby, and certainly in the entrepreneurial space, there is huge growth. Um, it could very well be that you can leverage your network. So if you don't know how to use social media effectively, there are, in fact, countless YouTube videos that help you to better understand how to do that. There are also additional courses that you can go and do, um, which I completely recommend. I did. I went and did a digital marketing course. Um, but there's also people in your space that you could potentially leverage and have conversations with. And this is part of why your network is so valuable. Um, and again, it's not the, net, the people you know, but it's potentially the people that they know as well. I had a meeting with somebody yesterday as a favor to somebody else. Uh, because they want to start a business. And that is about sort of leveraging that network um, to make sure that you're not just using your channels and having them active and having them prefer, um, uh, having them sort of playing out into the ether and having no impact. We have to have a definable sense of what it is we want to achieve with them. And that's why I was asking that question earlier about that jobs to be done piece and the answers, and maybe you guys are all working on highly secretive problem, uh, products and services, but the answers that came back were pretty abstract, um, very ambiguous. And I'm wondering if there's a really rigorous level of clarity when you do present your work on social media. And when you present your work on social media, do you have a definable, a definable expectation as it is what you want that image to achieve or what you want that social media content to do for you? So I see groups with lots of podcasts. I work with people who have really active uh, TikTok um, profiles and Instagram and their kind of mindset is well, let's just build numbers let's just get more and more people so visibility is great but is the goal just to have more numbers and more visibility on Instagram or is it to have that become a tool that you use to create um, avenues for access to more exhibitions or to have access to more sales or more engagement with people who are in a position to say yes or no to giving you more work to buying your product. 
but it is about being proactive in this space and it is about being strategic in this space and not just doing things for the sake of doing them because your time is valuable. Um, and that's certainly something you, you will, we talk about in the entrepreneurial space quite a bit is that every, it's a transaction constantly. You're spending time and that's one of your resources that you have. Um, so it's something to be conscious of. I'm going to move through this because I'm wondering based on the, the statement so far, do we really have a robust understanding of this um, in terms of what motivates your users to buy your products? You have the assumption at the moment that the products are bought because they're, so Deirdre, for example, they're authentic, they're sustainable, they're traceable. Um, and that resonates with some of, the, some of the users in your space. But do we know for a fact that's the case? Have we sat down with our users? Have we revisited? Have we included uh, feedback forms? Uh, with our transactions and with our sales to really get an understanding of what it was that motivated them. What was their first touch point? What is that customer journey that's in play in there? And part of that conversation, we can include what are the barriers? What's getting in the way? So when we're talking about a lack of visibility, well, it sounds like that lack of visibility is just an inability to understand or use social media. And you can learn about that very quickly. Um, so that's a mindset piece. The fact that, again, in this proactive entrepreneurial space, if you've got the mindset whereby this is my goal and it's something I want to achieve. And currently a lack of social media savvy is in my barrier. Well, then I'm going to learn how to use social media and I'm going to get better at that. And it's not just about, you know, popping every image up and making sure it's a, it's a good image, which is a big challenge for some of my clients. Um, but it is about being strategic in that space as well. So social media is a tool, but it's a, it's a pretty accessible tool to learn to use. It would pretty much lead me onto this in terms of you know, what are we afraid of in this space? Um, what are we afraid of in terms of making money, in terms of leveraging networks? Why haven't we already learned to use social media? You know, is there a fear attached to that? Is there a feeling that, well, I'm a creative and that's what I do and the social media bit is what other people do? We need to get a handle on what we're afraid of in this space. And you don't have to commit this to text. Uh, but I would suggest that there's a wider exploration um, that would be valuable for you in that space. Think about this um, right now, but on a long-term basis as well. Um, create that sense of urgency and a sense of purpose by setting yourself a goal. Um, affecting that internal locus of control. We'll talk about that goal-setting bit again in a second. But to me, when somebody says to me, I don't know how to use social media, and that's kind of it. Well, that sort of sounds like that external locus of control where others and other situations and scenarios are kind of allowed to affect me. Whereas in that entrepreneurial context, uh, you take ownership of it. You find a way to make it work for you. You find a way to learn how to do it. I see entrepreneurs constantly just upskilling, you know, finding solutions to problems that are presented to them. And it is that entrepreneurial mindset. And you guys are very definitely in that entrepreneurial space. And this is probably behaviors that you're not exposed to uh, consistently because they're kind of outside of our frame of reference quite often in the, in the creative and cultural and um, uh, spaces. What I recommend you do is, Dan, networks and Instagram are two places that I would recommend to young entrepreneurial creators. Networks and Instagram, absolutely. TikTok as well. I mean, you can use any of the social media spaces, but it is about how we leverage them appropriately. And it is about being strategic and having this goal in mind. This is what I want to achieve. Um, and building in goals that align with our overall goal. So I'm wondering how many of you have given time over to thinking about what do you want to do with your craft, with your design, with your wider creativity? What is it you want to achieve? And if it's just, I want to make more money doing what I'm doing, okay, well, then we have to increase our visibility. So our daily goal then in that space is to learn how to use social media better. The weekly goal is to start you know, leveraging that learning that we're doing on a daily basis, you know, we start building metrics into this um, so that we have a, a consistent journey in play. But it can't just be a case of, well, I don't know how to use this tool or I don't feel comfortable about going to, um, about going to gallery openings or exhibitions, or the, whatever, whatever that looks like, um, because there is a strategic element attached to this. And we can become, and as I mentioned earlier, we're kind of entrenched in a certain set of behaviors that we associate with being a creative. 
and they become massive barriers for our ability to achieve our goals, which for me, one of my goals is to make sure I have a full belly and a roof over my head, um, two of my big goals. Um, this is a business model canvas. I'm sure you guys are, some of you certainly sound like you're familiar with it. Um, I would definitely recommend, and again, I probably moved on a bit further than some of you because of the, the, the answers that I got back there, but thinking about who your customer segments are, Deirdre seems to have a pretty strong handle on who she chooses her customers to be. That's fair enough. Um, but do we have a sense of if there's a capacity to expand on that? Um, and what do, I'd be interested in understanding what you mean by choose. Um, is it that they must conform to the kind of guidelines you set out? Is it only people you know? Or is there capacity to really expand this? And you know, how much ownership do you take over the products uh, after they're out of your hands? So yes, think about your customer segments. Think about who they are, where they live. Exclude greenwashing. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, I identify with that. But there's a lot that's there's a lot of potential customers that maybe you don't know about who are not in favor of greenwashing either. Um, so it's about being a little bit more maybe exploratory and expansive in that space as well. Um, but yeah, I'd be I do a lot of work in inclusion and diversity, and I tell people I don't work for brand inclusion. Um, I work for genuine inclusion, um, and that's important. But it, there's still a lot of opportunity in that space. Um, so in terms of this sort of customer segments piece, it sounds like there's, and again, I'm suspicious of the products you're producing because we got such vague answers in the, uh, in the chat, but you need to get that really robust understanding of who your customers are today, as in your early adopters, where does that take you? You know, how can you create a narrative by understanding what it is your product does for them? Right now you're in the space of assumption. If you're working towards that entrepreneurial aspect, you're going to go out and explore and do some customer discovery and get a sense of what it is your product or service does. Um, that puts you in a position whereby you can sell your product more broadly. You can determine based on the, the various price points uh, around you that you've been offered to date or that you're engaging with that allow you to kind of um, escalate what it is you're asking for in there. But there's I'm wondering, would this would I have been able to pull more clarity if we had chat? But yeah, I'm sort of suspicious of the of the um, growth is in sales is not the same as increasing your number of clients. No, of course not, Dan. Dan, you've got lots of great um, lots of great soundbite statements. It's a pity we don't have the chat uh, in play because I would be haranguing you to expand on some of those. No, to this is I'll finish up on this. Uh, in terms of the discomfort I see on a regular basis with people applying a price to their work, this is one of the statements that I found massively valuable um, and has served certainly a lot of the students and it became kind of a running joke uh, with the students that I've worked with over the years. When people ask you to price your work and not everybody's comfortable with this, and certainly at the early stages of their career, people aren't comfortable with this. One of the statements I use is asking people, what is their budget for a particular project? Um, or what is their budget for a particular product? Again, we're kind of sometimes in a nice space where we can position our product on a website and the prices are attached, but that's not always the case. Um, and if you are uncomfortable with this sort of conversation or narrative, uh, in a one-to-one -one basis or when you're rolled out in front of a board of people and they're asking you around it, we can lead. That's no problem, man. Yeah, no issue with it anyway. Um, the statement might be that, um, or the, the question here that I find quite useful is, you know, what's your budget for this project? What I tend to do in a money-making basis is that every project I do that increases the the number um, is now my new foundation. And that's that's my asking point when people approach me after that for, for a new price. When they're unwilling to give you a budget, say, okay, well, I've done something similar for X amount of money previously. Where are you at on that? Um, that means that you've created new anchor bias and um, that they have to think about in terms of the kind of offer they make you. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have chat, which I would have really liked actually, but do we have any questions for me that I can answer for you? And I'll keep an eye on the chat box. And I'm going to make it really big on my screen so I can see it. Any questions for me?
Nope. Give it a second to see. Carl, if you are willing, I can take yep. this. Um, you know, I can invite everyone who's here today because I, I'm, I mean, I'm being very selfish here. I'm finding it really interesting, and uh, there are real nuggets that I can take out for various uh, uh, craft makers and, and designers. But if the group here, I, I can reconvene us in a couple of weeks in meeting mode. If, if yeah. that's better, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'd be no problem for me. I think that there's probably scope for that back and forth in there. Um, Absolutely, Deirdre. I mean, I think even on the um, on the site, there is different awards available to creatives. But um, most will look at it. <laughs> Dan answered his own question. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's funding rounds, countless funding rounds, um, the Arts Council. But there's you guys are also in the space where you could be looking at the local enterprise office uh, as well for funding. Now, I don't know what product it is you're producing. Um, because you were all very, very suspect and very sneaky and unwilling to commit to that. Um, but I would expect that there are countless funding rounds in all sorts of different industries at the moment. Um, let me just go back. Deirdre, in terms of sustainability, Deirdre, if, I'm not sure what your product is, but you might want to have a look at the European Institute of Innovation and Technology Climate Kick. Um, they provide funding for different types of projects and there could be an avenue whereby you could leverage some of their funding. Um, but there's also, and again, I'm not sure what it is you're producing because you're very sneaky, but there are a huge amount of different innovation events attached to uh, sustainability um, where there's funding also in those spaces. Um, I mentored on one for Trinity recently, well, last year. And I think it was 5,000 euros and 10,000 euros as um, marketing mentor, craft people, and writing and a filmmaker. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's any number of avenues whereby you can get funding for those. Uh, certainly in the mentoring piece. In the writing and filmmaking piece, yeah. The um, Arts Council have a yearly fund, I think, of about 80,000 euros for, the, for filmmaking. Um, so... Again, this is the sort of the opportunity to network. Do you know other people in the filmmaking space um, who've maybe already applied for some of these? There's a former student of mine who, um, Mags, who, um, what I suggest is some of you maybe connect with me on LinkedIn if you're using LinkedIn. It is indeed Mags Kane. Um, and she's an absolute superstar. Um, and she is sort of, She'd be pretty knowledgeable in that space in terms of the kind of funding that's available. And if you know Mags Kane, Deirdre, you can tell her I said hello. Yeah, Mags is great. Any other thoughts or questions? That's not really the case, Dan. Unfortunately, that's not actually the case. Lots of businesses need funding to get started and then they get their legs under them. Um, venture capitalist funding is extremely important. Lots of people need early stage funding to get moving. Um, so I would be pretty strong in my resistance to that statement. Um, and there's an awful lot of companies at the moment who have received funding because of what's going on on the outside our windows. Um, and it's not that they're consistently in trouble, but they might be struggling in a particular climate. So just something to keep in mind. Funding is not uh, a sign that you're running a bad business. And all of those startups, I, I still have to disagree on that one. Um, well, if you were funding startups for 40 years and they were failing, then maybe the, mm, oh, I won't go too far on that, but an awful lot of early stage businesses. Um, yeah, well, the, the rate for startups is, well, the rate of new ideas is something like between 70 or 80% fail. Um, but I 
inclined to think that an awful lot of time that comes down to per communication as well as as much as just per ideas. Any other questions or? Okay, well then in that case, Dan, we should all stay in bed and nobody should ever try anything. Uh, any other, any questions for me? Okay, folks. Um, what I was suggesting is that if anybody wants to follow up, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and as Emer said, we'll set this up so we can have in the EU intersection and interdisciplinary space where can we log our interest in collaborating. In, is that for the EIT piece or? Okay, I don't have an answer on that, Deirdre, but I would assume that that's one of those answers that if I Googled it, the question, I'd probably find the answer. Um, in the EU intersectional interdisciplinary space, where can we log our interest? <laughs> As we still speak English, Arm has an anchor role play. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, but again, it's one of these pieces and where being proactive on this and going out and finding information or finding the people who have the information is going to really serve you on that one. If that's an avenue you're, you're considering. I like it. Cool. No problem then. Yeah. Shall we leave it at that then, or? I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, oh. I'd like to thank you for being with us, Carl. I'll You're very welcome. Re reconvene with the group. Um, you know, I think there were, there were great uh, nuggets to explore here. And I, I really like your piece of that, you know, we can um, be strategic without being unprincipled. Um, yeah, I think it's... To me, it's an important point because sometimes we think about, I see this in, I see this in the business space as well, where people think of being strategic as being disingenuous. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I certainly don't, I, I've worked in business now for quite a while um, and I don't see that you have to sacrifice your values or your principles to achieve your goals. Exactly. But yeah. I really like people to go off, you know, think, come back with uh, questions to uh, bite back, back at your, your questions saying it's, it's a kind of a slightly different uh, format than we than we previously used. So I'd like them, everyone here to be able to take advantage of that. So I am going to uh, invite you back because it's, it's really interesting. And uh, I'll, I'll do it as a meeting mode and I'll keep it to Perfect. the number. Yeah. Okay. I'll send on these slides as well. So you have Great. them and people will have the questions. And I mean, if there's anything people take away, it's that just identify five people that you can network with quickly that helps you to achieve the goal you outline. Great. Um, yeah. That's good. Thank you so okay. much. And You're no very welcome. Thing, no such thing as a wet blanket. So thank you everyone for joining <laughs> us. And uh, thank, thank, thank you, Carl. Thank you so You're much. Very welcome. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.